And um, we were really describing the features of the action potential and how it um, really is dependent upon two channels, the events and activities that are happening at the voltage gated sodium channels and then the potassium channels as well. Um, and so we got here to talk about kind of what's really happening um, and how this very quick sequence of events is what's responsible for these communication um, events down the length of the neuron. Um, and so here, we're kind of reminding ourselves that this action potential is really an example of negative feedback as far as the movement of sodium and positive feedback, um, excuse me, positive feedback as far as the movement of sodium and negative feedback as far as the movement of potassium. So we can see here as far as the upstroke or the depolarizing event of the action potential, this is where sodium is moving into the cell. Now, because this is a self-regenerative process, as soon as we get to that threshold stimulus, the voltage-gated sodium channels are gonna kind of take over the action potential and they will continue to uh, move, open up and move more sodium into the cell. This will move us further and further and further away from that set point value, that resting negative 70 millivolts. And so we can think about that as being a positive feedback event. So if you were, um, I guess, you know, a little bit shaky about what a positive feedback is, um, hopefully this example will help to kind of clear that up. So a positive feedback change is required, right? So for a short period of time, we need the membrane potential to start moving away from rest. Um, not indefinitely, but for a short period of time, a very, a very a fixed period of time. Um, and so that happens. And then at that positive 30 value, we then see a turnaround of events where those sodium channels close. We now have a repolarizing event, which is uh, because of the opening up of potassium channels. And so potassium starts washing out of the cell and that is going to rapidly bring the membrane potential closer to rest. And so we can think of the movement of potassium as a negative feedback mechanism or a negative feedback event, okay? It's bringing us from positive 30 back down to negative 70. All right, so now we can start to think about the action potential. So remember I said we're describing the action potential here. We're talking about it from some different perspectives. So, so far we've been speaking about it as far as a membrane potential change, but we can also think about it as far as a permeability change. And so looking at it from a permeability standpoint, we can think about how the different ions, how the permeability of the different ions are changing throughout the course of the action potential. So we start off here in a resting state, and we already know that at this state, we've got a increased permeability for potassium than we do for sodium, simply because we have more potassium channels, the membrane potential looks more like the equilibrium potential of potassium, and it's really far away from the equilibrium potential of sodium. Um, and so this is where we start out at rest. Now we get a graded potential and we talked about what graded potentials are. They're these sub threshold stimuli. They can be depolarizing, they can be hyperpolarizing. And so they can kind of just fluctuate the membrane potential by fluctuating the permeability of either sodium or potassium. Remember a Depolarizing event is going to fluctuate the, the, uh, membrane, the membrane permeability for sodium. A hyperpolarizing event is going to fluctuate the membrane permeability for potassium. So by kind of fluctuating the membrane permeability for these two ions, we've got these small sub-threshold stimuli that we're calling graded potentials. Now, again here from a permeability standpoint, we get to a threshold stimulus, we get to a stimulus that either by summation or by a strong enough stimuli, we arrive at that negative 55, which is the threshold. When we get there, sodium channels kind of take over the rest of the job. That's why we call this a regenerative mechanism. We no longer need any more stimuli to keep this membrane potential change going. When we open up that first voltage-gated sodium channel, Sodium rushes into the cell 
And so this creates a positive environment as the cell begins to depolarize. And this change is kind of infectious, right? It's the other sodium channels, remember they're voltage gated. So they're gonna be doing a different thing at a different voltage. And so when that positive change occurs first, it kind of just spreads along the length of the neuron because now that depolarized segment is exposing the subsequent sodium channels. And so we have the spreading, this regenerative rush of sodium into the cell, which brings about this rapid increase in the permeability, which is simply, um, what the action potential is. That rapid increase in the sodium permeability, sodium rushes into the cell, and that's why we see the membrane potential shoot up to positive 30. Um, beyond that period, so at that positive 30, and I got a really interesting question, and I like when you guys send questions via email because, of its, because it's, it's kind of a soundboard so I can see what you're having difficulty with or what concepts are troubling. It's sometimes hard to predict, you know, what nuances you may not be able to appreciate right away um, just by talking to you. So when you ask questions, I can get, you know, a sense of where you're struggling with some of the concepts. So the question I got was, what is the importance of the positive 30 value also, what is the importance of the whole timing of the events? Why are, they, why are they timed? And what is the importance of positive 30? And so the answer is really right here, right? We've got the coordination of the closing of sodium channels, which has to happen exactly when potassium channels open. They have to happen at the same time. Okay, and so that's kind of where the timed component comes in. Remember, the inactivation gates on sodium are voltage sensitive, also time sensitive. So they've got that one millisecond delay built in. And that one millisecond delay also coordinates with the one millisecond delay for the potassium channels too. So the timing is important. The positive 30 is also important as far as closing of the sodium channels and opening up of the potassium channels. And more importantly, having those two events occur at the exact same time, okay? Um, this is why the action potential does not actually get to positive 60. We know that's where it's trying to go, right? Remember the movement of sodium is a reflection of the membrane potential trying to get to the equilibrium potential of sodium, which is really positive. It's at positive 60. We don't actually get there because positive 30 is a trigger to close those sodium channels and open up potassium channels. Okay, so that's kind of how the timing comes into place. Um, the very fixed coordination of having these events start or stop at an exact period of time is really important to keeping the action potential um, uniform. The action potential does not look different between one stimuli and another stimuli. It's always going to be the same action potential, the same amplitude, the same duration of time, no matter what the stimuli looks like, okay? And so having the timed component and the voltage sensitive component is what helps to bring that about. Okay. And so now after we uh, close those sodium channels, open up potassium channels, we've got a difference in the permeability here once again. So we decrease the permeability to sodium, um, which we can see here by this purple arrow. We increase the permeability to potassium, which we can see by this rise in the blue arrow. And so we've got potassium now moving out of the cell, which is essentially positive charge leaving the cell. And that's restoring that negative environment in the cell, which is helping to bring us back down to our resting membrane potential. Now, because potassium channels kind of remain open beyond the resting membrane potential, um, we see that the membrane potential kind of undershoots that resting value, and it's really trying to approach potassium's equilibrium potential, which is negative 94. It doesn't actually get there, but it doesn't stop at rest. It undershoots that value and is slightly more negative than negative 70. And then we've got the sodium potassium pump. So we're gonna, we wanna keep those in mind. They're on the cell membrane, kind of just doing their thing, you know, pumping sodium out, pumping potassium in. And so they kick in and they help to quickly restore the membrane potential to rest. 
and bring it back up from that negative uh, 85 or so, which is kind of undershooting that resting value. So the coordination of the sodium potassium pump, um, as well as the coordination of the uh, voltage uh, gated sodium and potassium channels is what kind of ends off the action potential and uh, gets us right back to the resting value. Now, after hyperpolarization, um, so we said that the membrane potential, potassium channels open up, potassium is now leaving the cell. Um, and so it goes down to about negative 85 as it's trying to approach that negative 94, which is potassium's equilibrium potential. Again, just like sodium, it never actually gets there because of the voltage sensitive nature of potassium channels. Remember we said potassium channels are gonna be inactivated if the membrane potential falls below rest. So um, they're activated at positive 30, they're inactivated if we fall below rest. So as we get down below that negative 70, this is a stimuli to shut those potassium channels. So potassium is no longer leaving the cell. Um, and so we're no longer trying to get to its equilibrium potential. The sodium potassium pumps can kind of kick in. And this is what kind of brings us back up to that negative 70, gets us back up to rest. So again, a coordination here of the inactivation of potassium channels because they're voltage sensitive, as well as the sodium potassium pumps is what gets things back to that negative 70. Now let's spend some time here describing the action potential. So there are a couple of features that describe the action potential and we kind of left off talking about these. First of all, it's the all or none principle. So the all or none principle states that an action potential will either happen in its entirety or not at all. Okay, there's no half of an action potential. There's no maybe an action potential. There's no longer action potential. Short, like an action potential is an action potential. Um, and we've been speaking about an action potential in a very fixed way. We've been talking about just the events. But if we think about the big picture, an action potential is really a mode of communication. And think about it like the letters in the alphabet, right? They are fixed, they don't change. The way that we put them together is what changes. And so we can have action potentials that are increasing in frequency and how fast we fire them um, or decrease in frequency, how slow we fire them. But the quality of one action potential does not change no matter what the stimulus looks like. Okay, when we get to that threshold value, that's the only condition we need to meet. And after that point, the action potential is gonna look the exact same as any other action potential. So we get to a threshold depolarizing uh, uh, event, which brings us to negative 55. We begin this action potential. Um, if we have a sub threshold depolarizing event, we don't have an action potential. If we have a supra threshold depolarizing event, so a stimuli that's really strong, we see the exact same action potential as we would see for a simple threshold depolarizing event, okay? So the quality of the action potential does not change. Um, it's always going to be a 100 millivolt change from negative 70, which is rest, to positive 30, where we see those um, channels being activated and inactivated, respectively. Um, we can also describe the action potential as being self-regenerative in that when we get to this threshold, there's nothing else that's required. The sodium channels will take over the rest and it will happen and it will be completed. So we can describe it as being self-regenerative as well as self-limiting. So it's not going to start and then maybe stop in the middle. It's gonna start and it must come to an end um, in that fixed amount of time, okay? Um, and then I also wanna point out another feature here is that they are unidirectional. So because of the refractory periods, and we'll talk about the refractory periods a little bit more coming up, an action potential cannot travel in the reverse direction, right? It has to always be going in the forward direction. And again, I want you to kind of be thinking about the big picture here. Remember, action potentials are very fast events. Um, they're responsible for all of our 
activities, right? They're responsible for movement of muscle, talking, walking, appreciation of light, sound, you know, smell, all of our sensory perception, all of our muscular communication, the, the movement of the heart, which happens 24 seven, all of this is being controlled and regulated via action potentials in a, in a similar way that letters are being um, utilized and coordinated in different ways to bring about all of the words in the English language and other languages, right? All of, you know, things like books and, and mu music. So letters can be coordinated in different ways to give us different outcomes. And the same is true for an action potential. Alrighty. Um, so we said that it's all or none. It is self-regenerative, it's self-limiting, and it is unidirectional. Okay, so when we have that threshold stimulus and we're kind of comparing two different stimuli here in the image on the right, we've got a sub threshold stimuli that gives us the exact same action potential as a very strong stimuli, okay? So we can see the action potentials here do not look any differently even though we have different qualities or different values to the stimuli. So it will not change the duration or the uh, amplitude of the action potential. And again, we can see that here. So just kind of reiterating that very same idea. We have a small subthreshold stimuli, another small subthreshold stimuli. We get to threshold. Let's say we combine these two by a summation. We get to threshold, and this action potential looks ex the exact same as a really large super threshold stimuli. Um, the quality, the amplitude, the duration are going to be the exact same. 